Welcome back to episode four in our Empowered Birth podcast series. Today, we're talking all about optimal maternal and baby positioning. Enjoy. Hey, mama, I'm sending you wonderful pregnancy vibes. It's time for you to guide you through. Let's take some time for And welcome back to the Pregnancy with Physio Laura podcast. Final episode in our Empowered Birth series. So it's unfortunately come to an end, but that's cool because it's been an epic series. Do make sure you go and check out the first three episodes. If you haven't already, there is nuggets of gold in every single one. We talk about the recipe for a positive birth experience. We talk about perineal preparation and knowing all about perineal tearing and recovery. And we also talk about birth plans and preferences, which is such an important topic. So go check those out in your own time. Today, we're talking all about optimal maternal and baby positioning. Now, this is something that the wonderful midlife Loretta, who you can find on Instagram at midwife Loretta, she does a lot of this in her work. Now, she is a midwife, she is a mum, she's a birth educator, she does acuneedling, and she runs online and in-person workshops. And OMP, which is optimal maternal positioning, is a big part of her work. She does a lot of teaching in this. So if you do want to follow this up, I definitely recommend you go and have a chat with Loretta because she's a real wonder in this area. But specifically what we're going to talk about in today's episode is the different pelvic movements during pregnancy that you can do to help with optimal positioning, the importance of keeping your pelvic ligaments supple, what the quote unquote ideal baby position is for birth, but also why there is a huge variety of normal. Her thoughts on baby's head engaging before birth and I share my personal story around baby engagement and the stories I had around my pelvis not being big enough for birth. We also do cover can your pelvis truly be too small for birth and why the stories we tell ourselves about birth and our bodies are so powerful and so important. So I talk a little bit about my stories that I carried through from my first two pregnancies and how I really needed to rewrite the script for my third because I had some really unhelpful stories around what my body was capable of and I think this episode is really going to resonate with you if maybe you've got some stories around your body not being capable or maybe being a little bit dysfunctional, midwife Loretta is really, really wonderful at talking us through this. So I really hope this episode lands with you. This is our final one in this series, but we have some epic podcast series coming up. So make sure you subscribe to the Pregnancy with Physio Laura podcast so that you do not miss out. There's some really great topics we're about to cover For the rest of this year, we've got so many plans. So make sure you subscribe. And if you do want to learn more from my wife, Loretta, she has also given us this epic bonus module for all Pregnancy Posse members about perineal preparation, tearing and recovery. So that ties in really well to episode three. But if that is something that you want to explore more, that bonus material she's given us is epic. So you can find out more about that and you can access that plus all of our podcasts, All of our weekly workouts, our amazing resources library, which covers so much about labor and birth preparation, our beautiful community forum. You can access all of that at thepregnancybossy.com. You can trial the membership for seven days. You can talk to me, ask me all your questions. I am like your on standby, on call physio once you enter that membership. So please do utilize me when you join up. Ask me all of your questions. I'm so happy to help you. So definitely go check that out if you want to access her free Perry Watt guide. Otherwise, enjoy this final episode, episode four in this Empowered Birth series, talking all about optimal maternal and baby positioning. Enjoy. I want to talk to you about maternal and baby positioning. So this is another highly, highly requested topic. <laughs> Was, I don't I, again I don't know exactly what it is if women are scared or we're just trying to put more on our plate but I think I get so many questions about positioning I think it's a real point of concern for women when they're told baby is not in an optimal position um, and women are doing all sorts of crazy things to try and get baby <laughs> in a good position so could you maybe firstly talk to us about what is OMP I'd never heard of that term before and what are we actually trying to achieve with baby and maternal pelvic positioning? Yes. So typically we've focused a lot on what positions our babies are in. But what I love about OMP is it's more about 
you know, learning about your pelvis, learning about the movements your baby needs to make through the pelvis. So babies don't just dip in and pop out. They have to do a lot of, they descend, they rotate. Um, yeah, they do some amazing things. Uh, so learning about that and then learning about how we can create balance in the soft tissues. So um, the ligaments, the muscles, the fascia that attach from the pelvis to the uterus. So obviously your baby's inside the uterus. And so if they are, if they have tension in them or if they are twisted or out of alignment, that's going to impact how baby then enters the pelvis and is able to make those movements. So it's all about learning about that. Um, so being mindful of movements during pregnancy and the things we do every day, movements we do in labour to help if we need, if we hit certain challenges, um, and then just positioning for, for birth as well and how we can optimise and create space, essentially. And for those who don't know, OMP is? Optim Optimal maternal positioning. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say that at the start. Just yeah, the yeah. important thing. <laughs> So is there like a generic set of advice for just the everyday pregnant woman who doesn't necessarily have a, like a quote unquote malpositioned baby is what's generic advice to optimize positioning for labor and birth? Yeah. So I think the key is keeping your pelvis and all of those soft tissues nice and supple and flexible so that we know your pelvis is amazing in the way it opens and allows your baby in and to move through and out. Um, and we know the sacrum is amazing at shifting back again to create more space. So we have all of these ligaments that attach um, you know, from the pelvis to the sacrum and then from the pelvis to the uterus. So if we can keep them nice and balanced and supple, we're going to hopefully create a smoother labour and birth. So I think just, you know, lifestyle factors. So being mindful of the way you're sitting, um, trying to sit in alignment. So you don't have to be spending lots of time and hours in forward leaning positions, but just trying to be mindful that you're sitting on your sit bones. So those bony bits um, at the base of your pelvis. Hey, my posture. <laughs> yeah, I know, I was going to say, I'm sitting here like a hunchback. Um, <laughs> I'm hunching over. Um, so you can maybe pop a towel underneath them or you can use those Pilates balls to sit on. Being mindful of the way you get in and out of bed, um, in and out of the car, the way you stand. So often we, you know, we do a bit of a hip pop and we put our weight on one side or maybe the way you're carrying another child or a toddler, um, they get pretty heavy. So try to always think about alignment, um, doing things like yoga, Pilates. They're really great for keeping your body moving as well as using your breath with movement, which can be great for labour. Um, what else we do? So with OMP, we teach there's six daily techniques. So the pelvic alignment techniques that you can do with your partner. So they're basically trying to balance those tissues and the fascia. So when you do them, we um, try and get you to hold for three minutes. And usually they feel really good. So they should feel like a nice stretch. And they should help with pregnancy discomforts mm. and um, your labor and birth as well so mm. that's what we teach in the program um, to do and then other techniques that you can use if you hit any challenge if baby is transverse or posterior or breech um, yes. or if you know maybe your contraction pattern has slowed down or there's some you know irregular um, contractions going on once you're in active labor those sort of things and how to troubleshoot with that. And are these the sorts of movements and stretches that you would do for your entire pregnancy or is it only for that third trimester? So anytime Ginny, um, so Ginny is the creator of OMP. Um, so she recommends any time from the second trimester to start yeah. doing them. And, and yeah, they say 15 minutes a day to birth your way. So um, yeah, really simple. Um, but yeah, obviously it takes a bit of time and effort to do that each day. So just whenever you can. And I just want to say too, Laura, it's it's not about, um, yeah, creating fear and saying that if your baby is posterior, for example, that something is wrong because it doesn't mean that at all. Babies are very good at finding space and doing the rotations they need to do. It's just a variation of normal. So just remembering that. Um, but if there are things that we can help that make us feel better in pregnancy and maybe allow that labour and birth to be a bit shorter and smoother, then I think that's, you know, again, empowering women. 
in their late mm-hmm. ones. And I think it's just acknowledging that in society these days, we sit so much. That's the real sort of problem coming through at the moment. That's the pathology is that we are so sedentary and we, we sit yes. a lot. Like the, the average person who works, say, in an office will sit to drive to work sit eight hours at a desk, sit to drive home, sit to eat their dinner. And I remember there was a campaign that came through, which was something like um, uh, limits, what was it? Limit sitting or being sedentary to no more than 23 and a half hours a day. And it sounds crazy because you're like, whoa, but it's essentially just rather than saying move your body for 30 minutes a day, it's saying yeah. just don't sit or be sedentary for 23 and a half hours. Because when you flip it on your head, it's like, wow, we really, that's a long time, but we are doing that. A lot of people are only moving their bodies for 30 minutes a day, which is not how we're designed to be. And I, I, I say this in my pregnancy posse program as well, because I think there is a lot of fear when it comes to baby positioning. I get a lot of women asking me about, I've got a breech baby. I've got a posterior baby. Baby's not engaged yet. You know, like, what do I do? Give me all the techniques. Mm. And I'm mindful. Like I do give advice. (laughs) I do give some stretches and things to do, but I'm also mindful that women don't then go, well, if I don't do X, Y, and Z stretch, my baby will therefore not be in a good position. And that's not true either. Um, I just say variety is key. So the problem with the way we move these days, pregnant or not pregnant, is that we move in such small ranges of motion. So like I said, we sit a lot. So of course, everyone's got back problems because our hamstrings are so tight and our backs are constantly tucked under and our pelvic floors are chronically overactive because we're slouching and um, movement and variety is key. So just move in a different direction. Just maybe try a rotation, (laughs) maybe try putting your going on all fours and dipping your pelvis up and down, like just moving in a different direction. I I encourage my women inside the pregnancy posse who Mm -hmm. do sit at a desk because that's, I think the hardest bit to get up and move around, sit on a fit ball, do some circles as they're sitting, stand up and do some, you know, up and down calf raises, because all of those movements are going to help when it comes to baby positioning as well, because it's going to mean that your pelvis is mobile and is supple and has its adequate room to allow baby to get into the right position. So definitely variety is key. Mm, And when it comes to babies, what are we actually aiming for? Like what is the, the perfect key in lock position for a baby to be, I was going to say delivered, to be birthed. <laughs> it's hard to break it. Uh, so again, I, yeah, I'm, I don't want to say that there is a perfect position, but when we look at, you know, what's going to take the least amount of rotations, it would be starting in either that LOT or LOA position. So when you look at the pelvis, if you look at the inlet at the top, where baby will enter. And again, this will depend on the shape of your pelvis. So there's variations with that where we all sit. But for the majority, when you look at it, the largest space available where baby will enter is side to side. So most babies will start on that left side um, and they'll often either start with their back directly facing to mum's side or slightly facing towards mum's front. Okay, so on the left side, slightly towards the side or front. So, um, and then they'll begin those other movements. So if they start in a posterior position, they have to almost do like an extra rotation before they're able to enter the pelvis. They can still enter from the right side, but it's when you look at um, the, our organs um, and where the space is, you know, we have softer organs on the left, so more space available for babies to enter on the left. Um, that's usually why they'll start there. Mm, um, okay, I like that. And what does it mean if your baby is posterior? Yeah, so it means that your baby is either, you know, sitting slightly. So we look at the and the little letters that we refer to with baby's position. So the left or right, and this is presuming baby's head down. Yeah. So left or right, so that refers to the side of mum's pelvis. So is baby facing towards the left or right side? And then occiput, so that just means if you look at a baby's head, that just refers to the like the back of baby's head. So it's presumed that baby's chin is nicely tucked into their chest and that top part is presenting first. And so when that part is presenting, it means that usually it will be sitting 
evenly on the cervix. So we're getting that even pressure and that that's the smallest diameter that's presenting through the pelvis as well. And the idea is the pressure from their head, so they're sitting in the right position, is the best way to dilate that cervix as your labor is, as your uterus is contracting, yes? Yes. So when their chin's tucked, you're getting that nice, even pressure, and therefore you're getting those nerve receptors are sending um, the signals to release more oxytocin. And as the baby's head puts more and more pressure on the cervix, you're getting more and more oxytocin and longer and stronger contractions. Yes. So sometimes if your baby is posterior, so um, sorry, I was saying, so that's the occiput. So we've got the left or right, which side, the O is the occiput. And then the next letter refers to which part of, we presume that baby's back will follow where the back of baby's head is. Um, so is baby's head, baby, back of baby's head facing towards mum's back, so posterior, facing directly to the side, so transverse, or slightly towards the front, which means anterior or to the front. Okay, so if most start, if your baby was posterior, it could be on the left or right side, um, but slightly facing towards your, your spine. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they can also be directly posterior, so directly facing to your spine as well. And for those um, women who get told, oh, your baby is sitting posteriorly, because I know I've been told this and it causes a lot of anxiety. Yeah. What does that mean? Because obviously we know, but not all women will know, you can still labor, you can still birth. What, what implications may it have if your baby is posterior for labor and birth? Yeah. And so, again, it doesn't always mean that something that, that there's something wrong. Um, but generally, there's a couple of things. So if baby's spine is facing towards your spine, a lot of women will experience more back pain, um, which can be really challenging. And often that outweighs the pain at the front. Um, so they're not getting that contraction pain at the front, they're getting it more at the back, which can be really intense, as you know very well, Laura. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but interesting, my first baby was not posterior, but I had a lot of back pain. So it's not mm. a hard and fast rule either. Mm. Um, so back pain would be the first one. And the other thing is another little clue if ba the baby might be posterior. And this comes back to with a posterior position, it means that often their little head, their chin is not as well tucked into their chest. Um, because of the way they move into the pelvis. When they move into the pelvis in that LOT position, they press on a part of the pelvis that helps them tuck their little chins in. So if they're posterior, they often will have their um, heads will be what we call deflexed. So if, it's, if the chin's well tucked, we say the head's nice and flexed. If it's not and their little chin is up, we say it's deflexed. And that then impacts that pressure that the head is able to put on the cervix. So we're not getting that quite even pressure. So that might look like, you know, you might get some coupling with contractions. So you might get like two together, then a big space. And this is sort of more talking about once you're in that active established labor period, but it can definitely impact early labor as well. And mean that it, you have a prolonged early labor phase. Um, so you get might get coupling or you just don't get that regularity and it's hard to kind of establish. Um, and again, that your body is working towards that, like your uterus is trying to create that pressure. But if we can try and support that with the movements we make, mm. then, you know, that's that's a good thing. Again, if it means that if you don't want an epidural um, or you don't want to have a cesarean, well, then knowing about some things we can do to work with that can be helpful. Mm, definitely and I feel like I tried all of the things I did a yeah. fair I would say I was pretty good at not being sedentary or sitting I was moving a lot and I still had a posterior position right. yeah, baby so I think that's where it's nice to just be like you can like it's so good to try all of these things because yeah. you're setting yourself up in the best position possible but also sometimes babies are like nah I want to hang out here and that's cool you know like I know women who uh, doing all of the things to flip breech babies. And I think sometimes they blame themselves as well. Like, what did I do? Did I sit too much? And I just want to remove that from anyone because it's like, sometimes babies just do what babies are going to do. You know, like there is nothing you can do, but I think it's really good and helpful to be armed with all of the tools and the stretches and the movements so that, you know, I ticked that box, you know, I did Exactly. everything that was within my power to make that pelvis as you know like accommodating to that position as possible and maybe it didn't work out I'm, I'm curious about engagement so 
I don't know if this does relate to OMP or if it's completely different, but I get so many pregnancy posing members talking to me about my baby's not engaged yet. What can I do to help my baby engage? You know, they start to question, is there a pelvic misalignment? Is there something going on here that baby's not dropping down? I know my personal experience with my first and second, and I it, it did cause a lot of discomfort because I kept being told baby's not engaged, baby's not engaged, baby's not engaged. I've come to realize that um, I'll let you speak, but I've come to realize that that probably really wasn't that important. Um, But it made me think that I had this like story that my pelvis was too small and that baby couldn't get down because Mm. my pelvis was small and no one actually directly told me that, but that was the story I started to make up. So what's the go with engagement? Like do babies engage beforehand? Is that a good sign, bad sign? Do some babies never engage until you go into labor? Like, is it anything to do with pelvic alignment? Yeah, I think it, it can be a bit of both. So again, no hard fast rule, <laughs> but most babies will, you know, engage with, if you're having your first baby, most will engage from around that 34 to 36 week mark. But it, again, it's just a range. Mm. Not all. Some, we, we find that for women having their first babies, they're more likely to engage before labor just because there's less um, stretching to the uterus. The uterus hasn't changed its shape. It hasn't carried a baby before. Um, and those, you know, all those other soft tissues haven't had that extra stretch Whereas when you're having your second baby, so engagement, it just means that that the largest diameter of baby's head is sitting in that pelvic inlet. Yes. So it's it's not necessarily a problem. It's when you're when you've birthed before, it can take having contractions for that engagement to happen. So you might need that pressure of a contraction to get baby's head in the pelvis. Mm-hmm. And I suppose it's only a problem if the baby's head. So sometimes they can be head down but their head is still sort of high and floating around. So there's quite a big space in between that. And the risk of that can be that if your waters were to break, you know, the cord could potentially move down in front of baby's head. So I think it's called a a cord prolapse. So that is obviously um, an emergency, um, obstetric emergency. But um, yes, for some women, as long as that head is sitting there and it's not sitting up, really high in the distance then it doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem but you could definitely look at the pelvis and maybe getting some body work that sort of thing um, if you are concerned and you know doing some of the OMP techniques might be helpful Um, but again it, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong Mm hmm yeah I know I know it caused yeah a lot of like is my body broken stories Mm -hmm. for me because it wasn't engaged and I think my own personal reflection on that is that I think I'm a long gestator I I didn't go into spontaneous labor until 42 weeks and so I think when I was being assessed at 37 weeks to see if the head was engaged I think it was just like well I'm you know let's say for that one five weeks off I don't need to be engaged yet like I, I don't know if I'm just making up stories but I feel like that makes sense to me as to why I wasn't engaged then because I was still so far off actually getting into labor that it it just was early would that make would that be true yes of course and you're right like there's still so much space there Mm. you know your baby doesn't need to be I yeah everyone is so different it's such a spectrum Mm. Um, I suppose you know if we're thinking about or what we might flag it as you know okay well what's going on why hasn't this baby engaged is there another reason is there something going on with the pelvis is there some kind of I don't know, some kind of obstruction or something in the way. And that's, you know, you, you're thinking about it. But, yeah, it's like you said, it, it doesn't need to engage before that. Like yes. as, you can know. engage in labour, which I think is really engage reassuring. Yeah. And I guess on the flip side, if your baby is engaged, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go into labour anytime soon. Oh. <laughs> so I think a lot of women then go, oh, cool, that's going to happen tomorrow. And then three <laughs> weeks later, they're still pregnant. They're like, What? It's another unhelp. I had such early engages. Honestly, both of my girls were head down and low from about 32 weeks. And I remember I went through the public system, but I had a beautiful colleague who was an obstetrician and he said, oh, that Loretta, that head's so low. You're going to have this baby. I was about to go on holidays. Yeah. And I I felt it. It was so low, but no, I was, then it made me think, oh, what if I do? And I know that that's not true, but 
it's not helpful because then women get to 40 weeks and they're like oh my god still yeah. not I'm still, still haven't had this baby yeah. <laughs> it doesn't so many people do comment on you these days, you know, it's just a free for all when you're pregnant. And so you do always get those comments of like, oh, your, your baby's looking so high, your baby's looking so low. And I think it just confuses women because they're like, hang on, am, am I going to go early? Everyone thinks they're going to go early. Maybe anyway, they're like, I'm going to go early for sure. I know I am. <laughs> and then I think it is really hard when you're like, oh, I am still pregnant at 40 weeks. Yeah. Like it's just mind blowing. <laughs> now, I'm just wondering, and this is, uh, I didn't prep you for this question, but I'm just wondering for those women who have been told or who truly do believe their pelvis can't fit their baby, like they have a small pelvis, like what is the evidence behind that? Like I know some women are doing pelvic measurements um, and there's like a real science behind it maybe, but I don't, I truly don't know enough about it. What's the go with women's pelvises being too small to birth? vaginally yeah that's such a such a good one to talk about Laura because I hear that too and you know when we talk about beliefs and things it can be one people take on from maybe their mums or their grandmas like or you know my mums could never birth us vaginally because her pelvis was too small and I have one as well um so it's really there is no accurate way to measure the pelvic diameters it's so um such a myth um such an old practice the only way you can know is to give labor a go yes. because, you know, and unfortunately women are still told this, Oh, I don't know, big baby. You know, someone will have a feel of their tummy and say, Oh, it feels like a big baby. We know that that's not accurate. We know ultrasounds are plus or minus 15% either way. Mm. The only way we can really know is to give it a go because labor is that dynamic process so your baby's working with your body, your pelvis mm. and your, your pelvic floor, all of those things are happening together. And so you really don't know until you try. Mm. And that's where I get a little bit confused because when I have women come to me and say, I've been told my pelvis is too small. Mm. And I always just think, wow. So we know the pelvis is dynamic. So it's not like this static your pelvis is 50 centimetres, your baby is 52 centimetres, therefore not going to happen. It's like, mm. but we know the pelvis is dynamic. When you're, yes. you've seen those amazing images of the sacrum moving out of the way so baby can come down. So I'm always just really curious to know if there was more foundation for that, but it sounds like mm. probably not. It's, not it's just and a risk averse, you know, guess. I, I it actually, is. Yeah. And unless, you know, it, it, can be an issue in developing countries where there might be true what they call CPD. So that um, I'll, I'm going to make a mess of this cephalo pelvic uh, disproportion. I think I might have got that wrong. Where the pelvis maybe doesn't grow to its full um, range because of malnutrition and that sort of thing. But mm. in a place like Australia, that would be very rare. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but mm. you know it would not be a common occurrence so mm. yeah it's again it's a not helpful belief that sometimes women are told to have certain things such as you know booked in for cesareans because of that belief mm. um, by their care provider but it's just not true and I think it's so hard to get that out because if you don't trust your body birth I, I can only imagine is going to be quite challenging because you're going to face up against all these challenges and if you don't have that trust if you've got it at the forefront of your mind that maybe I can't maybe my pelvis can't I that that challenge is going to win out I think and mm. I know for my first two births I don't think I truly thought my pelvis was equipped for childbirth because I had that messaging that I had big babies didn't engage small pelvis this whole like the key and the lock, they're just not a combination. I have a lineage of cesarean sections from my mother and my grandmother. So I had that story of like, well, obviously, you know, that's a generational thing. Um, I got told by a midwife um, as I was getting wheeled into a C-section that don't worry, love, that baby was never coming out of your vagina. And I was like, oh, I know you are trying to be supportive right now, but that is the worst thing you could have said to me because oh. I feel broken. I feel like my body is flawed, you know, like you you I'm meant to be able to do that, but I can't. So I'm a bit dysfunctional. Oh. And it really took that my third pregnancy and birth to face up to all these stories I had told myself. And I just like, I, there's a lot of emotions around my third birth, but so much of it was like, 
oh, my body is not broken. Like it, it's an okay fit, you know, like it's not this like awkward fit where babies just can't quite get through. And it was so liberating for me. And it's not always the way for everyone. I understand that. That's just my personal story. But I do think, oh, we need to be so mindful of our language because when you tell a woman that her pelvis is too small, even if that's all you say and it has no foundation, but that just spirals a woman into all sorts of stories that their bodies are broken. And it's so hard to build that trust up again with your body, I think. So oh, that seed, doesn't it? Or, or your baby's big, it plants the seed and it's hard to undo that. I'm yeah. so glad you got to experience that, Laura. I know. I'm like, I can do it. Hey, look at that. <laughs> and so much of that started with this whole engagement you know, like, oh, and I started telling myself, I truly thought that like, I, so I would get really intense lightning crutch, like really intense. I'd be walking across a road and I'd have to like stop because I was just getting stabbed in the vagina. That's what it felt like. And I started telling myself that, oh, well, that makes sense because I would talk to other women. I'd be like, do you feel this? Cause I'd I'd get it so intensely. I'd be in the shower and I'd have to like cripple over because I was getting this stabbing pain. And so I, because our brains are amazing, I started making up this story that, ah, that's my baby, like butting up against all my nerves down there because it can't fit, you know, like it's all the wrong nerves and giving me that, because that's not a, that doesn't feel like a comfortable sensation. Like women would talk about like that pressure, that bowling ball, oh, baby's head's low. But I was like, that's never, that was never my experience. Mine was like, I told myself my baby's trying to get down but it's, it can't fit. It's, it's not, it's not fitting well. That's why I'm getting this rule, like what feels like a pathological pain. Anyhow, when I sat down with my midwife in my third pregnancy, I said to her, and I'm so glad I said it because otherwise I would have carried this story through. I said, look, I get this lightning crutch, you know, like baby feels like it's really butting up against my cervix, sharp stabbing pain. I've told myself, I was really honest. I've told myself a story that you know, that means baby's not really fitting. It's head's too big for my pelvis, blah, blah. And she just looked at me and she said, no, that is a good sign. That means your baby's really nuzzling down. It's getting itself comfy. It's getting itself in the right position. Don't ever take those pains as that's a bad thing. That's a great sign. And that completely flipped my story. And I felt like a weight had lifted off my shoulders because I was like, oh, that's good. So every time I felt that stabbing pain, instead of being like, oh, bummer that baby's trying so hard but it's just not working I was like oh yes baby you get down there woo like it just it just shows me the power of the mind and the power of stories and the power of language because it completely flipped what I told myself about my body and I just want to say that for anyone who might be listening who resonates with that because it was such a powerful narrative change for me and I'm sure there'll be women out there who are like oh maybe maybe that could be true for me too so I just want to finish on that (laughs) hello mamas I hope you got so much out of that episode I really hope that it helped you if you have got a baby that is quote unquote maybe not in the ideal position I hope it helped allay any fears that you might have around what that means for you and your birth experience Um, I also hope that if you are this isn't absolutely like I'm sure a small proportion of women but if you are in the camp that I was where I felt a little bit broken or like, you know, there was something wrong with my pelvis. I know a lot of V-back mamas feel this way. I really hope this episode gave you some confidence and maybe some inspiration that you are not broken and that, you know, your body is still so, so good and knows what to do and you can trust it. But you've got to rewrite that story in your head because it can be really, really challenging to overcome. So I really hope that if you are that person and this podcast spoke to you, I would so love to hear from you. Come on over at my socials, at Physio Laura and send me a message or comment on my podcast snippet for this episode and let me know what you got out of it and maybe if you are starting to rewrite some stories that you had around your body and your pelvis or if you are doing something special or exciting maybe you're hanging upside down on an ironing board whatever it is if you feel like it's working to help with baby positioning I'd so love to hear from you and if you want to check out any more of Loretta's work you can find her on Instagram at midwife Loretta if you want to chat to her more about her OMP work she would be so happy to chat to you about that she is a wealth of knowledge Thank you so much for being here. I really hope you got a lot out of today's episode. And like I said in the intro, if you want to follow this up, if you want to learn more from me, 
or if you want to access Loretta's guide all about perineal recovery, that is our bonus module for this podcast series. And we usually do have a bonus module for every podcast series I put out. So all Pregnancy Posse members get access to that. If you want to come and jump in the membership, join me, work your body twice a week minimum, move your body in such a beautiful way, open up those pelvic ligaments, get yourself ready in the best possible physical way for birth and labor. Come and join me. I'm over at thepregnancyposse.com. You can trial the membership for seven days and I'll chat to you more then. But in the meantime, mamas, I hope wherever you are right now, you are feeling fabulous in your body. You are looking after yourself. You're moving in a way that feels really, really good for you. And yeah, maybe doing your pelvic floor exercises too. That's always a good reminder. I really should tell people that more often, shouldn't I? Anywho, I will catch you soon for our next amazing podcast series that we have coming up and I will talk to you soon. Bye.